these are your review notes for probability and statistics. We're going to start off with some basic probability. So probability is the likelihood of an event occurring, and your probability is represented as a fraction, a decimal, or a percent, and it's always going to be between 0 and 1. And you'll sometimes see that written like that, where the probability P is between 0 and 1. The probability of an event happening and the probability of an event not happening are known as complements of each other. And those two things have to add to one. For example, the probability that it rains plus the probability that it does not rain has to equal one. Sample space is the list of all possible outcomes and it's listed in those curly brackets. So rolling a die, one through six, flipping coin, heads or tails. We do not list duplicates in our sample space. Mutually exclusive events have no overlap or no intersection. A Venn diagram is a visual representation for us to show the relationship between two or more sets. So we're used to seeing Venn diagrams in English class or social studies class usually, but we use it in math class. In math class, it's important that that outer rectangle represents the overall set. So that's my entire population. The circle represents each individual event. So this would be event S. This circle would be event B. If I wanted event S but not B, it's just the outer part of the circle because that inner part is the overlap. So that part is S, but it's also B, and I don't want that. And neither S nor B is your outer part of your rectangle because remember that in math, the outer part of the Venn diagram, that rectangle counts as part of my sample space. Let's talk about and and or. So and is your overlap or your intersection, and the notation is written for you there. It's an upside down U. In a Venn diagram, your overlap is that middle piece where the sections overlap. In a two-way table, it's where the two things overlap each other if you were to highlight them. So for example, if I wanted the probability of seventh grade and snowboarding, here's my seventh grade, here's my snowboarding. This piece here is my probability. That is my overlap. For OR, it's the union of two sets. Your symbol is the U. Your formula is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus their intersection or minus the overlap, if you want to call it that instead. In a Venn diagram, it's both circles combined. Two-way table example. If I do the same thing, but this time I want seventh grade or snowboarding, seventh grade, I have 240 out of 500. Snowboarding, I have 270 out of 500. And my overlap is getting subtracted 130 out of 500, which gives me 380. Notice how for this, all of my denominators are the same. Conditional probability. When we're finding conditional probability, we're restricting our possible outcomes based on the condition. The denominator will be a row total or a column total. You're looking for key phrases like given that, if, among, of, Notation is the slash, your formula is given here, but in a two-way table, if I have something like the probability of seventh grade, or let's do it the opposite way, let's do the probability of snowboarding, given they were in seventh grade, I only care about this row, nothing else matters to me. So my denominator is no longer out of my total of 500. It's out of 240. 
and there are 130 of them. So this would be something that said like snowboarding given that they're seventh graders or of the seventh graders, what's the probability that they were snowboarders? Something like that. Independent events. You have um, some formulas here. We looked at this formula for the most part. And remember that when they are equal, they're independent. When they're not equal, they're not independent. So that's pretty much what we have for probability. And now let's talk about statistics. With statistics, there's a lot of vocabulary. So population is the bigger entire group, whereas the sample is the smaller subset. Sample, smaller. When something is bias, it means that it's unfair or that one favor, one outcome is more favored than the other outcome. To get the best sample, we want to have a representative random sample. A census is a survey or a poll of everyone in our population. An observational study is where the researcher simply observes and does not interfere with the study. Treatments are not imposed and no causation can be established. A controlled experiment is when treatments are imposed. The subjects are split into two or more groups. Usually one is a treatment and one is a control. Treatment is our condition that's being imposed. A control is a group used for comparison. They're not receiving a treatment. Sometimes they receive a placebo. A placebo is a pill or a dummy treatment that doesn't contain an active ingredient. Simulations can be used to model real life events. With a simulation, it's usually about selecting numbers with a random number generator. It's important to know that you have to have equal digits. So if I want to select five people, I can use the numbers one through five. But if I want to select 15 people, I can't use the numbers one through 15. I have to use zero one through 15 because all of my numbers have to have equal number of digits. And there are some examples for you here. With statistics, we have lots of different ways that we can represent data, histograms, box plots, things like that. We typically see histograms or dot plots, um, and we describe them using the shape, center, and spread of that data. So the shape of our data can either be symmetric or it can be skewed. And here are some examples. So my first one is symmetric. It would also be what we call a bell-shaped graph. Our second one is also symmetric, but this one is not bell-shaped. It may be called bimodal. You can see that as well. My next two are both skewed, and they're skewed in the direction of their tail. So this one is skewed left, and this one is skewed right. Measures of center include the mean, the median, and the mode. The mean is the most important one for us, and the mean is our average. So that can be found by adding all of your data up and dividing by the number of data. It can also be found using our calculator with L1, sometimes L2, and then stat, write, one var, stats. All of those steps are down below for you as well. Symbols, the mu, the Greek symbol mu is for population. X bar is for sample. Measures of spread 
include the range, interquartile range, sometimes known as the IQR, and the standard deviation. For us, standard deviation is what we talk about most often in this class. It measures a typical deviation from the mean. It tells us on average how far away a data point is from the mean. And we can describe a data by their standard deviation and their spread. So the larger the standard deviation, the more spread the data is and the less consistent. So for example, um, a dot plot would look something like that. The smaller the standard deviation, the less spread the data is and the more consistent it is. And you'll sometimes see the phrase clustered as well. And something would look like this. All of my data is clustered or grouped together. Here are those calculator steps that I was mentioning before. I am not going to read through them, but I do want to point out that you need to be careful when you have a frequency table that you are using L2. If you are not using a frequency table, make sure that it does not say L2 when you go to run your data. Normal CDF. Probabilities and percentages of scenarios can be calculated using normal CDF on the calculator when the distribution is approximately normal. And that's the key phrase that you're looking for in the question. We have three general cases. Um, our first one is between two pieces of data. So it would look something like this because you always want to create a picture and shade between your lower boundary and your upper boundary. All of your calculator steps on how to do this with normal CDF are listed for you here. The next one is when I'm looking to the right of a data point. Here's my lower bound and keywords would be more than or above. Your upper bound here, guys, is on the right-hand side, and we like to use a really big number because it's kind of approaching infinity, although it does depend on the scenario of the question, but we put that in as our default. And then our last scenario is when it goes to the left, so I don't have a lower bound, I only have an upper bound, so my lower bound is like negative infinity, but we put in a really big negative number. And keywords here you're looking for are less than or below. So anytime we see approximately normal and they're looking for a percentage or a probability, we're following the calculator steps for second VARs. Sampling distributions. Sample, sampling distributions talk about the variation and how we can analyze our distributions of samples. So samples naturally vary from sample to sample, which is known as sampling variability. The larger the sample size and the more samples you take, the closer you can approximate the true population parameter. Uh, true population proportion or your true population mean. And as sample size increases, this is the important part, your variability decreases. In general, your margin of error is two times your standard deviation. Now, most times in the questions, they're giving you an output some kind of graph, a histogram or a dot plot that they've run a simulation on, and the mean of that dot plot or histogram and the standard deviation of that data is given to you in the upper right or left-hand corner of the graph, so that's always where you want to go. A 95% confidence interval is the center plus or minus two standard deviations because two standard deviations, this part here, is my margin of error. Your center can be a mean 
or a proportion depending on the question. And then usually after they ask you to find a margin of error or to find a confidence interval where you'd actually need to put numbers in here and divide it into two pieces and get a number for each part and then write it like this or sometimes you'll see it written like that. Um, then they ask you to make a conclusion and that conclusion usually talks about likely or plausible or unlikely or statistically significant. So basically what happens is you have your center and we have created a 95% confidence interval around that center. And anything inside the 95% confidence interval, which by the way is found by adding two standard deviations and subtracting two standard deviations. So anything inside your confidence interval is what we consider likely, plausible, or usual, or any other synonym of those words. Anything outside of our confidence interval on the tails is what we consider not likely, not plausible, or statistically significant. And it doesn't matter if it's above or below, it just matters whether it's in the interval or outside the interval. All of your symbols, once again, are listed for you here. We've gone through some of them already in the video, but otherwise you have them there. So those are your notes for probability and statistics.